morning. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Today's uh, theme is Solve for X. And for me, X has always been a story. And the challenge or the equation or the problem of solving for it is how to tell it in the most uh, appropriate way, in the best way. How to get true stories out to people uh, and make them really respond to them. For the last 14 years, I've uh, worked for National Geographic and I've gone out into the world and I've tried to come back uh, and write big picture stories. You know what these stories are. They're sort of the, the story that takes a complicated idea or a person or a place or an event and boils it down, distills it into the broad strokes. Um, consider for a moment National Geographic. Even if you've never read it before, you know what we do. Lions. We tell you everything you want to know about lions, right? We will boil that thing down into a cuddly, ferocious predator for you. We will tell you everything you want to know about elephants, sharks, mummies. We own that. We have mummies in the basement of National Geographic. Uh, global warming. That's another one that we do well. We will turn global warming into a map. It's the prettiest way to experience a looming catastrophe. Um, <laughs> So for years I did this, I did this sort of big picture narrative. And it's not a bad way to do it. The big picture generally helps an audience understand something quickly and get into an idea or a subject that they may not normally be exposed to. But there's also dangers with this idea. And um, a few years ago I started to feel weirdly aware of how we are increasingly sort of flooded with these big picture stories, almost on some days to the exclusion of everything else. So I wanted to change. I was ready for a change. And I was casting around for a way to do this. I no longer felt like life was a headline that I wanted to sort of coast through. I think you all know what I mean. If we think about the country for a moment, we're sort of living in a headline summary era, aren't we? We have things like China rising. We have the gun debate raging on. And the one that I keep coming back to is a nation divided. Do these, do these headlines or these big picture stories actually make us more connected to our shared reality? I don't think so. And in fact, after too much of it, I start to feel disconnected from reality. I want to retreat. I want to move away from it. And I think a lot of people, I know a lot of people feel this way. Uh, we want to retreat from the flood, from this feeling of being surrounded and constantly bombarded. And it has the effect, the big picture actually has the effect of making us start, start to think and behave in smaller ways. We pull back. We associate with groups of people who think like we do. We sort of tribalize. And this does not make us more aware. It actually has the opposite effect of making us feel a little bit more estranged and, uh, and small. So, where did this change for me? A few years ago, I was asked to go to a remote desert in northern Kenya to do a story on a lake, a lake called Lake Turkana, a beautiful lake in the middle of a sort of nowhere. This uh, enormous place had a problem. The water was so slowly drying up. A combination of climate change and economic pressure was working to evaporate this massive lake. And so in the not-too-distant future, this beautiful jewel in the desert, which is home to 10,000 crocodiles and flocks of flamingos so large that they would blot out the sun in sort of a fabulous pink confusion when they took off. This would vanish. And there you have it. I've just sort of summed up the big picture for you. National Geographic is sometimes the journal of, uh, of bad things about to happen, unfortunately. So I went to this place and I spent a few weeks traveling around the lake and talking to the people who lived there and trying to understand what was going to happen to them if this beautiful natural feature suddenly vanished or vanished even over time. Uh, and so I was doing this, I was working with a photographer, we were traveling, we were talking to people, we were in asking them to share their stories with us. But when I got to this fellow's story, it really started to change for me. This man is a fisherman, was a fisherman. And one day, he had gone down into the warm brown waters of Lake Turkana to check his nets. He was standing waist deep, or maybe chest deep, in the water, and he heard a sudden noise behind him. And then a crocodile attacked and clamped its jaws around his waist and started swimming out toward deeper water with him in its mouth. This is amazing. And he told me that he felt no pain. 
He remembers a white light. He remembers the, dis the sounds of human voices in the distance and the sounds of birds, almost like music. There was this warm feeling, a sense of peace. He told me he would rather have stayed there. <laughs> Instead, he came to his senses and realized what was happening, and he did something that they teach every boy in his town. If you're ever attacked by a crocodile, go for the eyes. And so he did. He jammed his thumbs into the eyes of this crocodile, and it spit him out long enough so that he could swim to shore. And he had made it onto land, and he was stepping up out of the water, and he turned around, and the crocodile had come back for him to take one last chance. He was able to escape. He made it to the local clinic where they stitched up his injuries. And it, but he wasn't healed, and he was in no way on his way to healing. Later that night, he fell asleep, and he had a dream that the crocodile had crawled up out of the lake and come to find him in the clinic. He had a dream that the crocodile was crawling down the hallway to get him. Now, this guy has never recovered from that, and to this day, he's never gone back into the lake. He now makes his living a meager living by repairing the nets of other fishermen. This was an amazing story. From a storyteller's perspective, it had everything you could possibly want. It had drama. It had a strong character who could remember things like that had happened to him. For example, this guy remembered what the crocodile's mouth smelled like, and he described it as when you crush a fat tick, this feeling of old blood and rot. That's amazing stuff. But I knew that it would never make it into the pages of National Geographic, because despite its vividness and its richness, it was too small. It didn't speak to that big picture of water disappearing, climate change, and sort of a landscape in transition. Now, I have notebooks full of stories like this from years of work in the field, and it felt like such a waste to me. This man's story would just live in my notebook or die in my notebook, ink fading on paper in my you know, study somewhere with a row of other notebooks containing similar stories. And I really wanted to find a new way to do this, and in Africa at that time, I was complaining about it to my editor, and he said, dude, relax. Have you ever thought about Instagram? <laughs> and I had not, because Instagram for me was like cats and food and Kardashians, and it was like, I was like selfies, things that I, you know, I see them every day. Do I need to see more of them? Um, but so I was grumpy enough, and I resisted, and I had never adopted Instagram. But so finally, I got myself an account, and I started to explore it. And I realized that this was an undiscovered country for storytellers like me, because here you have a very powerful thing happening. You have a photograph, and then you have a space for words. And when people see a photograph, they have this immediate reaction to it. It almost happens unconsciously. A moment is created where we can enter a story together, if you do it right. And so I started to play with this. The word space is about 300 words, so that's not much although people do complain that long captions are a problem on Instagram. But I started to cast around and look, and I, I realized that the Gettysburg Address is less than 300 words. So you could copy and paste one of the most famous speeches in American history and plop it into an Instagram caption and read the whole thing without even having to scroll. So if, you know, not to compare myself to Lincoln, but <laughs> we had a powerful space here and we had an opportunity. So we st I started to tell stories on my own Instagram account, stories like, this woman, whose title, she lived in the same village as a gentleman who was taken by the crocodile, and her title translated out of the Dasanetch language into English as healer of last resort. So this wonderful, probably butchery of, of what her actual title was, but this was the only way we could render it into English. And she was the one who, when the clinic had failed, when the medicines had failed, when you were hundreds of miles away from a paved road and you can't find any respite from your illness, you go see her, and she takes you down to the same water where that guy was attacked by the crocodile, and she sits you in the shallows, and she covers you with that warm, ancient mud and rinses the badness away, back into the void of the lake. This is a wonderful story. These two women were, in their community, they were something like midwives, but they also practiced female circumcision. Now, when I went to Africa, to this part of Africa, I thought I knew all I needed to know about female circumcision. Brutal, primitive, screw that. I didn't think there needed to be much more of a conversation about this practice. But the journalist in me also realized that I do need to talk to these women about it, and I realized something amazing when they started to talk to me, that they were subtly and slowly changing this practice. 
They were rebels, insurgents within their own culture. And uh, by making the smallest little cut, just a drop of blood, they realized that they could satisfy the desires of the elders who were in charge of everything and also start to phase this practice out. They could see a time in the future when it would no longer be necessary or part of their culture. And by doing this, they were saving dozens of girls from a brutal practice that they had endured themselves. Now, this was a wonderful story. This is the kind of story when you're a writer, you want to find it. But it wouldn't fit into National Geographic magazine. It was outside the scope of that big picture that I was starting to do. So I told it on Instagram. Now, let's back up for a second. Why would a writer like me, who's used to dealing with thousands of words and a dozen pages in a magazine, want to go to this tiny little space with a phone? And um, there's a couple of reasons for it. Mostly, it's about audience. National Geographic, the print magazine, has four million subscribers. Most of them are older, most of them are white, and most of them live in the United States. Instagram is an entirely different universe. It's 800 million users. That's like a galaxy of stars. 80% of them live outside the United States, and most of them are young. Now, if we could leverage this, this combination of Instagram and National Geographic, we'd have something truly remarkable. Because Instagram, uh, National Geographic's Instagram feed is one of the largest in the world. When I started, it was about 50 million followers, but now it's up to nearly 90. If we could reach even a fraction of that audience, we could tell stories that we'd never been able to tell before. We could deliver all these vignettes, these smaller stories, these individuals, in a way that would touch people immediately in a way that the print magazine never could. So we started an experiment. We started to do this, and we sort of hijacked National Geographic's feed. We didn't ask permission. We didn't tell the executives we were going to do it. And this also allowed us to not have editors looking over our shoulder. We just started to tell stories on Instagram, on National Geographic's feed, and we reached tens of millions of people, and it was an amazing response. It used to be that it took a year or so before I would ever even get a letter from a reader of the magazine, and they would tell me something like, you spelled this wrong. <laughs> Not encouraging. But here on Instagram, we would have sudden and immediate reaction. Not all of it good. You've all, most of you have been on Instagram. You know what the comments look like after a while. And one of my favorite was uh, the people who told me that my captions were too long. It's like, I'm not forcing you to read it, man. You, don't have, you can skim through this. And the other people who bothered to tell you that they're going to unfollow you because you wrote too much. That's an interesting phenomenon. But we started, we, since the, my early experiments, we've told dozens of stories on this platform, and we've been able to reach people in a way that we could never have done before. We've told stories that sort of tug immediately at your heartstrings, animal-human friendships here. This boy didn't have many human friends, but he had found a baboon, a young baboon, and they were inseparable. And within this story, there was a tragic kernel, which is something that humans are also drawn to. The baboon would ultimately grow up, and would become too strong and too aggressive to be a playmate anymore. And so what usually happens is that the men of the village would take it out into the woods, and they would have to kill it. But we sometimes just told stories that were just more fun and more interesting. And here you have a, an iceberg being towed across the North Atlantic Sea right through the territory where the Titanic had sunk more than a century ago. This one was incredibly popular for some reason, and I think it's probably because it looks like a swimming pool. Um, and then we had stories, so we tried to capture wonder, we tried to capture a sense of relationships, a sense of joy and sadness, but we also tried to explore moments of empathy. And this is one of the more complicated stories and controversial ones that we ever attempted, because this is the face of the enemy. This is an ISIS fighter, and he had just been captured in the city, Iraqi city of Kirkuk, where he had gone to tell a story about the battle against ISIS. This young man had been interrogated all night, and he was probably, after I interviewed him, being, going to be led into some back lot and shot. Because in Iraq, that's what you do with the ISIS fighters. What's the point of keeping them around? As I spoke with this young man, I sort of had this feeling, as many of us do, what do, we, what do we need to talk about here? You're an evil person. You've made a bad choice. This man was 21, didn't go to college, didn't really go to high school. He had been captured, sneaking back into his city to visit his mom. Now, this created an interesting moment, 
because suddenly he was just a stupid kid with a mother that he wanted to go see. He had been out on the front lines for who knows how long, who knows what he had been experiencing, and he just wanted to go home and see his mother. Most of us can identify with some feeling like that, right? And most of us have probably made a really stupid mistake that we regretted. Does that mean that this guy should get our sympathy? Does it mean that he should have been killed? Those are not questions that I have to answer, but it does allow us to explore the question and think about it in a new way. So since that time, we've done, as I said, many stories on the Instagram platform, and I find that's an incredibly effective way. It's my most favorite place to try innovative stories and to try new types of storytelling. We don't do the same stuff that we would do in the National Geographic magazine. We don't do newspaper reporting. We try to do other types of telling, other types of sharing, and find other ways to open up a conversation with the audience. And, you know, let's, let's be real about this. This is Instagram, okay? So we're not, we're not changing the world here. This is just one way to feed yourself with refreshing stories. And after all of these experiments, I've learned a few things. And one of them is that people want small stories. They want short stories that open them up to the wonder of the world and that give them some other way to react to the stream that we are constantly bombarded with. Most of you have probably felt this way. There's too much news, too much Trump, too much guns, too much violence, too much everything. It's like, I want to check out. But the small stories create a space in the stream. They give us a sense of calm, and they allow us to do a couple of things. One of them is to be more aware. We actually don't live at that big story level most of the time. We live in a dense fabric of interconnected stories that are constantly moving and shifting. This is where our lives happen, in the connections that we have with other people and with little events. This is where the wonder truly is. And if we start paying attention to this, we're more mindful like the yoga instructors want us to be, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But we also take back a creative control over the way we react to the world. And that is what we really want. We want to experience this sense of expansiveness and connectivity to the stories that affect our lives. And we start paying, what would happen if we started paying more attention to these things? We would open ourselves up to moments of wonder, and we would regain that sense of connectivity and expansiveness that we so naturally desire. Thank you.